in uh, the uh, Gospel of Luke, in chapter 2. We will read from verse 1 to 20, and we will have the, uh, the text on the screen. Luke chapter 2. Verse 1 to 20. May I ask a volunteer to read it for us? And thank you, Johan. Johan, would you mind to come to the front and read from here? Thank you. Luke 2, verse 1 to 21, the birth of Jesus Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him up in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. <coughs> and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So far God's word. Right, so uh, please, before we go into the sermon, uh, allow me to pray. Sure. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, wonderful privilege, which is to read your word, the word from the King of Kings. But I pray that you help me to bring it with humility and by grace. Compassion with love, but with the sternness that is required as well. I ask you to help me, myself a sinner, that I can be transformed by this world before it transform your people. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Our well, Christmas is a uh, certainly uh, one of the most uh, celebrated events in the world and it is uh, it is celebrated uh, in uh, different ways by people uh, for some Christmas means uh, a family reunion for some other people it means a gift great food but unfortunately for some people it also means loneliness because they find themselves alone without their relatives. Maybe people in elderly houses not having the visit of their relatives anymore. So Christmas may mean different things to different people. Last week we saw the meaning of Christmas for Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
And I think it's good for us to also see the meaning of Christmas from the standpoint of the main character, Jesus himself. Uh, so to do this, uh, we will try to look at four parts, four aspects of Christmas in this sermon. We will look at first, uh, is Christmas a true story? I think we should start from that. Is it a myth or a true story? And the second part, we will ask ourselves, uh, who was that baby in the manger? And then uh, after we look at what, who is that baby, we also ask ourselves, why was that baby born this way? And finally, we will ask ourselves, how should we relate to this baby? Now, let's start with the first part, which is uh, Christmas. Is it a true story? Now, if you ask these questions to our friends who are not believers, they will probably say, no, it's not a true story. And I think it's a logical answer. Indeed, uh, flying reindeers, uh, snowmen, a North Pole elf, uh, these are fictional characters. So it makes sense to say that it's not a true story. But there is another story of Christmas. We need the one in the Bible. And if you ask again, many people, including some Christians, but let's say some non-Christians, they will also say, no, it's not a true story. And they have maybe a stronger reason to say it's not a true story. Because in fact, the divine participation into the birth of a person who is supposed to be destined for greatness is not such an extraordinary story. Actually, if you look at into the Greek and Roman mythology, we have cases of Greek heroes who were supposed to be born from the divine intervention. For instance, if you look at the story of uh, Perseus, the ancient ancestor of the Greek people, according to the mythology, it is said that the Zeus impregnated his mother through a golden rain, and that's how he was born, and later on he would become a great man, great Greek person, a great Greek hero, and he was even the great great father, the great grandfather of Hercules. We also have similar stories about, uh, for instance, Alexander the Great, it is said there are some stories going on, some legends saying that uh, actually his father is Zeus. That Zeus actually also impregnated his mother through a lightning bolt. And therefore, that's why he was able to do this amazing conquest. As you know, he managed to conquest the ancient world before the age of 30. That's impressive. But Therefore, the birth, the birth of Jesus from the intervention of God to a virgin Mary, maybe that's also one of those stories. But there is a difference. There's a difference uh, when we come to the story of uh, Jesus. Because in the story of Jesus, uh, we have some at least very strong, too strong evidence that it is a true story. Uh, last summer with Marina and the kids, we went to uh, the Science Museum yeah. in Paris and uh, we went to uh, uh, see the, uh, a very interesting exposition on Ramses II. Uh, you may know that Ramses II is the greatest of all the pharaohs and uh, we, there were a lot of people coming to watch this exposition about the life of, uh, of uh, Ramses II and it was really impressive. And when we look at all the people in the queue to see this uh, wonderful exposition about Ramses II, it was very clear to me that they all believe that whatever was exposed to them was a true story. In fact, how do we know that a very old ancient story is true or not? Historians, they have two criteria to check and identify whether a story is true or not. And one criteria for them that they use is they actually find the number of copies, identical copies, about that story. Because it's very difficult to find the original manuscript. So you usually find only the copies. The more you find similar, identical copies, the higher the chance that the story is true. The second criteria that they use criteria that they use is 
they look at the time lapse, the time gap between the first copy. So basically, you have the event that takes place. You have uh, uh, the uh, the original manuscript that was written, and then you look at the time when this copy was written. And if the time gap between these two, the original written manuscript and the copy, if the time is short, higher the chance that this story is true. If the time is too long, there's a high chance it's not true. Now, if you look at, for instance, the story of uh, Herodotus, so one of the greatest and the basic book about history, all the history that we know about the Greek, the Persians, and uh, it is written by Herodotus, and it is called Histories. That's the name of this huge work that he did. And we believe whatever is written there, Alexander the Great and all those things, is written in those, uh, in this, in these books, these stories. Now, when we look at these two criteria, we find that uh, the number of copies, identical copies about histories from Herodotus, is eight. If you look at the time lapse between the original manuscript and the copies when they were written, the time lapse is one thousand three hundred years. You can do the same thing with uh, Caesar the great Caesar, you will find similar numbers about the stories about Caesar, which we all believe. When it comes to the Lord Jesus, the number of copies is an overwhelming figure. 25,000 identical copies about the event of Christmas, about the life of Jesus, that we find. And when we look at now the time lapse, the gap between the first manuscript and the copies, we found 30 years. Much, much shorter. From a historical science, for the historians, this is a strong evidence, and they conclude, and we have to conclude, if we believe in those criteria, if you believe in all those stories about the Greek, Alexander the Great, then we come to the conclusion that this is the most historical documented event, Christmas, and the life of Jesus. But there is another evidence, which is even more stronger, which is stronger, sorry, than this historical criteria. That other criteria is actually the conviction from the Holy Spirit that this is the truth. In fact, when we read the Bible with a genuine and honest heart to seek the truth, we become convinced that the voice speaking to us through this book is the voice of our Creator. We become convinced that it is the truth. Just like a baby is convinced that the voice he or she is hearing is the voice of his or her mother. In fact, that the reason why we have seven billions of Bibles sold, it is by far the best seller in the history. Seven billion. One human being out of three confesses that he believes in Jesus. So yes, Christmas is not a myth, it's a true story. Now if we say it is a true story, now let's look at who is that baby in the manger. Now we read in that text in Luke chapter 2 verse 11, we read, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now the word used here, Lord, is a Greek translation of the word Yahweh, which is the name of God. So when the Greek translated the Old Testament, whenever they find this word Yahweh, they would translate it with Lord. So this angel is making here a striking statement. The angel is telling the shepherds that this baby is God. Of course, that's why we are not surprised when we read in verse 18 down, Luke chapter 2, verse 18, we read, when those shepherds went and, tell, and told people what the angel told them, this is what we read about the reaction of the people. Verse 18, and all who heard it wonder at what the shepherds told them. They wonder, really? He's God? But I think... I think the person to maybe inform us the best about the identity of this baby is the baby himself. Once he's grown up, is the Lord Jesus himself. 
So what did he say about himself? Now he made some outrageous claims. I just list some of them to you because of time. He said in John chapter 8 verse 12 that he is the light of the world. Who can say that here? I mean, that's quite a claim. I am the light of the world. He also said in John chapter 11 verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection. Whoever believes in me will not die. Even if he die, he will live forever. He made another claim in John chapter 14 verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to God except to me. I mean, this is very exclusive. What about the other religions? He made another claim in Mark chapter 2. We read the story of some friends coming into a house and they, bring their, they brought their friends so that their friend who was a paralytic, he, was, he could not walk. They brought him on the bed and they brought him before Jesus and Jesus looked at him. The need of that man was to be healed. But what Jesus told him, he said first, your sins are forgiven. The people around, they say, who on earth can forgive the sin of a man if it is not God? And they say, this is a blasphemy. So he claimed to be God. Only he could forgive the sin of a man. In Matthew chapter 25, before he would be crucified, he, tell, he told a parable and then he said, on that last day, I will judge the world. He said he will judge the world. In John chapter 8, verse 58, he told the Israelites that before Abraham was born, I am. I am is the name of God. I am existence. Pure existence. I am. No need to add one more word. I am. No time. Not I was. Not I will. I am. He's above time. He said that he was. He is. He will be. I am before Abraham was born. But these are terrific, amazing, striking claims. And I think maybe the most shocking one is in John chapter 20, verse 28, 29, when one of his apostles, after his, re his resurrection, the apostle came and saw him, you came from the dead? And then he said, my God. And Jesus didn't rebuke him. He accepted to be called God. So he claimed to be God. But is there any evidence to support those claims? I mean, someone who says he's God, he should come with some evidences. Now, when you go through his life in the Bible, we see that his teaching, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, has never been bettered. Even non-Christians recognize that this is full of wisdom. We have never heard such a thing. His works, miracles, never matched. His character, no sin found in him. When he was accused during his trial, he said, if you find the sin in me, please tell me. And they were silent. His fulfillment of prophecies, more than 300 prophecies, the kids mentioned to us that it was a prophecy that he would be born 700 years before he was born. And in details, even the place he would be born, and even the date he would be born. And he fulfilled them all, 300 prophecies. He said when he died, he will rise, and he rose. He conquered death. His disciples were completely petrified. He was crucified. They saw him. They saw their friend, their Lord, being crucified. They were completely petrified in fear. Just a couple of days later, the same people, they were able to go outside and tell people, we are not afraid. He is God. He is the Lord. What can make his friend behave that way? The same Peter who denied him was the one who stood in public in Acts chapter 2 and preached about him on the day of the Pentecost. And the fact that we are here this morning, more than 21 century later, I think those facts are backing up his claim. Well, a man who made this kind of claim, we only have three possibilities. Either he is lunatic, so he's fool, and we should shut him, put him in a jail, or in a special house for treatment, or he is himself the devil to say such a thing, and we should spit at him. Or he is who he said he is. 
friends, brothers, sisters don't have many choices. We get shot in, put him in a jail. We get spit at him, or we get bound up before him. That's the only choices we have. As far as I'm concerned, and I hope, you will see what I see, what one third of mankind sees, that he is, we say he is, that he is God. But the angels, they didn't only say that he's God. They also said something. In verse 7, they say, And she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. So the angel claimed that he was not only God, but that he is also a man. Now this becomes complicated. God and man? Is he, was he half human? Half God? Or he was human and then later on he became God? Oh, what is that thing? Let's look at it a bit closer. And I think one of the best places we can find the light on this uh, mystery is in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. I will read it for you. If you have your Bible, you can open in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Now we are doing a case for Christ now. Verse 5, I read. Have this mind among yourselves. Oh, so this is the Apostle Paul writing to some Christians in the city of Philippi. Or Philippi. Not Philippi, Philippi. And then here, he said to them, have it, he's telling, he's writing to those Christians, he said, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he was in the form of God. When you say form, it doesn't mean just shape. It means the essence of God. That's the correct translation. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, we found the same word here, essence, substance, human substance, godly substance. So here, verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now if we look at verse 6, if you look at this uh, short paragraph, you will see a number of things we can learn about this man this baby in the manger about his identity now the first thing we can see here in verse 6 he said that he was he did not count equality with God a thing he was God before Christmas before Christmas he was never a man he was truly God he's the second person of the Trinity And in fact, that's what I mentioned to you earlier in John chapter 8, verse 58, when he said that before Abraham was born, I am. So the first thing we agree that yes, he was God in the first place, before he became man, not the other way around. And then we read now in verse 7, but he emptied himself. So before he became man, what happened at Christmas, brothers and sisters and friends? Remember we said this is a true story. He emptied himself, it means he abandoned his glory. In fact, when you look at the place he was born, it's a very humbling place. He was born in a manger. Now this is, and we will see later why it is important. So he humbled himself. He didn't look at himself as God. He came to share humanity with his people, the people that he loves. Sometimes we hear people saying, where is God with all this suffering? He came. And this is a terrific and impressive act of humility and love. But when he came, he came with all his glory. And Isaiah, again, the same prophet prophesied about his birth 700 years earlier, he said in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He gave up his privileges. He dropped his uh, robe of majesty and took on the robe of flesh. 
But we read verse 7 that he did something extra. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. He took the form of a servant. He could come and just be from the king of heaven, become the king of earth or the king of Israel. No, 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 no. That's not what he chose to do. To do. He came as a servant and he served his disciples. He washed their feet in John chapter 13. And he said, he told them before he was crucified. The greatest is the one who served the others. And this is one of our key values as Christians. We are great when we serve others. We should realize that Christmas for us is a time of great celebration for him. It was a time of deep humiliation. He washed the feet of his disciples while angels bowed down at his feet. He Man's maker was made man. He, the ruler, the ruler of the stars, he was nursed as his, as, at his mother's breast. He, the bread, became hungry. He, the fountain, became thirsty. He, the light, slept. He, the way, got tired from the journey. He, the truth, was accused by false witness. He, the judge of the living and the dead, was church by a mortal judge. He, the justice, was sentenced by the unjust. He, the teacher, was beaten with whips. He, the vine, was crowned with thorns. He, the foundation, was suspended on the wood. He, life, died. That's ultimate love and humility. But we learn also in this journey from heaven to earth at Christmas, we learn also that he became human. And that's what we read in verse 8 of Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he became man. Now, this is something, of course, <coughs> difficult for us to understand. Often we have a wrong perception of who Jesus is. He said, oh, he is God. Or he just took, you know, the shape, the appearance of man, but actually he was God. No. He was 100% God, according to the scriptures. And he was 100% human. He got human genes from Mary. He was truly human and I'm going to explain to you hopefully why this is extremely important that he was human. There is no doubt that he was truly human. There is no doubt because he really looked like humans. He had brothers and sisters. He was born from a woman like all of us. He worked for 30 years like a carpenter. And it was so obvious that he was human that we read later on in Matthew chapter 13, when he went after some time, he went back to his hometown, Nazareth, and he was doing impressive things, and the people of his town, they look at him and they say, this is not the carpenter. For them, he's just a carpenter. Ask yourself, how comes for 30 years, nobody said anything about he is God. John had to say, John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, he had to say, look, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. He had to say that for people to recognize that he is the Lamb of God. He was hungry. We see that when he was fasting in Matthew chapter 4. We saw that he was thirsty in John chapter 4. He was thirsty. He asked for water to drink. We saw that he fell asleep. There was a storm in Mark chapter 4. A huge storm in a boat. He was sleeping. He was so tired. He was sleeping. He was truly human. He dressed like us. He had the mind, a man's voice. He was so human that we learn an incredible story in John chapter 7, verse 5. His own brothers and sisters, they did not believe him. This is what the Bible says. John chapter 7, verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. For them, he's just a man. Now, how could a man be God and man at the same time? How could someone be omniscient, knowing everything, but still has to learn? If you read this chapter, you continue because we stop here in verse 21. But if you read it all the way to verse 52, you will see it is written, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and man. How can someone omniscient, who knows everything, has to increase in wisdom? He has to learn. He has to learn how to be a carpenter by his father, Joseph. How can these two be reconciled? 
How is it possible? Well, come to Bible study. I will explain further to you. But the scriptures is clear. It was God and man. And that's extremely important. There were two centers of a consciousness in him. Two wheels in him. The will as God and the will as man. That's why, for instance, when he was about to go to the cross, and then in Luke chapter 22, we see that he asked his father, he said, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. He was hesitating to go to the cross. That was his will as a human. But his will as God was to go to the cross. When he said, I don't know when I will return, this was the human part of it. But his will as divine, his knowledge as omniscient, he knew when to come. That's one of the mysteries about the person of Jesus. He was both human and God. And now this leads me to the next part. But why then he has to do this? Why he has to be God and human? Why this baby was born this way? Now to understand this, and this is extremely important, this is the heart of Christmas. We read in verse 14 of our text here, oh sorry, in verse 10, we read, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news and great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angel spoke about the good news, about a Savior. A Savior who, of course, is supposed to save us from something, from a danger. But what kind of danger was the angel talking about? Now, he gave us some, uh, some tip here in verse 14. The angel said, Glory, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So, the danger that is supposed to save us from is the danger of a war. Because the angel said, now there is peace coming. Peace on those who found favor in the eyes of God. So the danger here is a war, the opposite of peace. But war against which enemy? And many of us made a mistake to think that the war is against Satan, the devil. No, the war is against God. Now let me explain to you quickly why it is against God. And God is... I think the worst enemy we can have. That's why in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, the Bible says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's God. Humanity, mankind, is in war against God. Now how? What am I talking about? Some of you may ask. Now I take you very quickly to the beginning of creation. When God created the universe and everything, the planets, the animals, the sea, the waves, human beings. It was perfect and beautiful. You read that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God looked at his creation and said, wow, it's perfect. And we see that in this creation, there are laws. It's regulated by laws. You see the planets, they obey what we call the laws of nature, physics. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest physician of all times. He was a strong Christian and he said that he found the laws of gravity in his maybe the most impressive book on physics, which is Principia Mathematica. He said, because he's a law giver, this triggered me to search and to find the laws and he found the law of gravity. He started from the law giver God to find the law of gravity. When we look at the planets, the cosmos is well organized, perfectly organized structure. There are laws inside. And all the things obey the law. As I mentioned to you, maybe two weeks ago, when God speak to, speaks to the nature, the nature obeys. He will tell the waves, go and stop at, on the shore at this particular point. They stop there. He, tell the, he tells the planet, go around your orbit, but don't move one inch. They stay on the orbit. And when he comes to his creature, we're supposed to reflect his glory. Mankind, he said to man, obey my eternal moral laws. The laws of morality. And man goes, no, I want my autonomy. As I explained to you earlier, autonomy comes from two words, autonomous, nomos is law, auto is self. I want myself law. I want to rule myself. So man declare war. He destroyed that beautiful creation. And the first man, Adam, who was perfect before he declared rebellion against God, 
the destroyed, the profane, the pure and holy creation of God. This is what we have done, mankind. This is what we have done. When someone has done something, a beautiful masterpiece, and you come and you destroy it, you declare a war, a war against that person. And this is what we have done when we don't want to obey God. And as a result, God being the judge of the universe, he has to do justice. Who on earth will accept that a judge just forgive a criminal? Any judge that does that will say that judge is corrupt. Any good judge must send the criminal to jail. And why we send the criminals to jail? Because we want to remove them from having negative impact on the society. That's why we put them in jail. And in the case of mankind and God, that jail is called hell. But mankind, those who destroy his creation, he will at some point judge them after death and put them there so that they don't anymore destroy his creation. This is the story of the Bible. This is the war against mankind and God. And then some men realize that the situation, the war against God is hopeless and cry out to God, help, you need, please forgive us. And then we see the, uh, now many religions. This is the story of all the religions. The religions now, they say, we need to find a way to find peace with this God. And if you go to Islam, to Buddhism, to all religions, they have this in common. To bring sacrifices, to pay, to repair what they have done against this God. You will find this common point in all religions. But there is a problem. They offer sacrifices, it can be food, it can be maybe fasting, it can be all kinds of sacrifices, but those sacrifices are not accepted because they are two key criteria for the sacrifice to be accepted. And we find that injustice. When a criminal does something, offend a person, a victim, for the penalty to be accepted by justice, there are two criteria. The first one is that the person who commits the offense is the one to pay the penalty, not another person. And of course we see that whenever a new religion brings animals for sacrifice, it doesn't match because the animal is not the one who rebels against God. So it has to be a human being because mankind rebels against God. So the first criteria we fail. Any religion fails on that. And then the second criteria is that the sacrifice, the penalty, the payment that the religions wants to bring to God In order to receive forgiveness and have peace with God, that penalty must match the worth of the offense. That's why the symbol of justice is a scale. You have on one part the offended, the offense, and the payment must match the value. So what is the offense? The offense that God creates man perfect, Adam, the first man. And we destroy, we pollute that beautiful creation we've seen. So in order to match, we need to bring a sacrifice, a payment that has the worth, the value of the pure man Adam before the fall. That means we need to bring a pure man without sin. And that's impossible. And now I hope you understand why Jesus has to be a man and God. He has to be a man because only a man can pay the penalty. Because men committed the sin, the rebellion. But it has to be God because all the men coming from Adam, we have the original sin in us and we are sinners. None of us here is pure. We just have to put our thought on the screen and we show to people we will run out of this room because they are horrible. We don't want anyone to know them. I will be the first to run out. Because of his divine nature, cannot see. That is why, brothers, sisters, friends, Jesus is the only mediator. And that's why we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Yes. Christmas is a good news that God has found in his wisdom the only way to reconcile, to forgive us, to give us peace with him, without compromising his justice, which requires the payment, 
because a good judge doesn't let the criminal and punished. And he took that punishment upon himself. Now this brings me to the last part of the sermon. If Christmas is a true story, if that baby is truly God and man and the only qualified sacrifice to bring peace between earth and God, how should we relate to him? Well, as I close this sermon, I would like to bring your attention on something very special about this man, God, Jesus. Think about his life. Really, please, friends, brothers, sisters, think about his life starting at Christmas. He was born in an obscure village from a peasant teenager of women. And then he moved from Bethlehem to another obscure village. He worked as a carpenter until he was 30. Not a great job. He was not a lawyer, not a doctor. For three years after, from 30 years old, he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never had office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside of a big cities. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the town he was born. He never did any of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While he was young, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friend ran away. One of them disowned him. Another one betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies. And then he went through a mockery of a trial. And then he was crucified. In between two thieves. His executioners gambled his only piece of property. His coat. When he was on earth. Because he was not rich. He was finally put into a bowl of grave to the pity of a friend. 21st century have come and gone and today he is the center of the human race. All the armies which have ever marched, all the navies which have ever sailed, all the parliament which have ever sat, all the kings who have ever ruled have never, never impacted the life of human race as powerfully as this one solitary life. Friends, you have two possibilities, two responses to this life, to this man. Two responses. In the story of Christmas, we saw many characters. I would like to I invite you to look at two characters as we close this song. And we can do like one of them. We can respond like Herod, who was the king in those days. Herod believed that this baby, once he would be grown up, he would overturn him from his seat, his royal seat. And Herod rejected him and did everything he could to kill him. This is recorded in books of history. We can do like Herod because we think Jesus is a threat to our autonomy, a threat to our arrogance, our pride, because we don't want to bow down before another one. We want to stand on our feet. We want to rule our life. We don't want another ruler over us. Herod didn't want another ruler. He wanted to stay and remain the ruler. That's one possible response we can have on that Christmas. But we can also have another response. Which is a wiser response. Is the response of the wise man. 
They traveled far away from long distance. And they came. And when they saw this baby, fragile, tiny in the manger, when they recognized that he was God, as God. And they bowed down before him. But they brought the most expensive gift that they could find, gold. And this morning, at this Christmas, we can do like this wise man. Maybe for once, we can make a wise decision and bring the best we can bring to him, the best of us, which is our heart, our life. My missionary said, it's no fool who can lose what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Lose your life. You will never be able to keep it and receive what you will never lose. Eternal life in Jesus. Let us take a time to meditate on those words. And I think uh, Miley and Deirdre, you have uh, some more songs which will help us to meditate on those words, on the meaning of Christmas. Amen.